扫扫圈。
Thanks for having us here. It's truly a pleasure to be here, be interacting with you guys and me being able to teach you today and looking forward to a good collaboration with this team for the next few days. We've got a lot of awesome events and trainings all lined up, which we're eager to, to move forward with. So I'm Lieutenant Wilson, General. <laughs> test, test. All right, there we go. There we go. Nice and loud. So I'm Lieutenant Wilson with the U.S. Navy, General Surgeon by Trade here with my awesome team that are running the triage mass casualty. Today we'll be going over things like basic life support, basic triage, and how to respond to a disaster scenario. Moving forward, we have an awesome event on Monday where we're going through everything we learned today, more live action and how to coordinate and move through a bunch of patients that may flood wherever you are and overwhelm a situation. How to organize that and make sense of it, prioritize patient care, and move them to appropriate care. On Tuesday, the 29th, is our big event. So we've been here with Pacific Partnership all across San Fernando doing different trainings and different events with multiple members of the community, the government, and the military. And this will be coming together in one unified event on Tuesday, the 29th. You all will be there and be a huge part of this event too applying things that you've learned today and incorporating that with the Coast Guard, the Armed Forces of the Philippines. And the big event will be our urban search and rescue event. So the Coast Guard of the Philippines are being trained up on how to rescue and extract patients that are stuffed in buildings from high up or down in rubble in a big urban environment. They'll be extracting patients bring them out to us, and from there we will triage them, provide basic care, and get them to the appropriate level of higher care. All of that is things you'll be learning today, and we'll be reviewing this information a few different times leading up to this big event. So truly excited to move forward with this today, and I appreciate all your participation and this collaboration. So thank you. I'll move forward with introductions with my team. We will also have members of the AFP join us today as well. They're currently en route here. So you'll see some other um, uniforms here in just a little bit, okay? All right, we'll kick it off this way. Hi, good morning. My name is Lieutenant Springley Payer. I am a critical care nurse in the United States Navy. I've been an ICU nurse for about 10 years now. Uh, I also do uh, en route care for the Navy, so air, land, and sea when we move patients, that's part of my job. So today I'll be helping you teach, uh, or helping you teach some basic, what we call TCCC, or some uh, combat casualty care, so kind of trauma lessons. And then we'll also go over the logistics part in any disaster setting, or even just in your day-to-day -day life of nursing, logistics and patient flow is going to be huge. So we're going to go over that because it can make or break how well things go for you. So I'm really excited to be here. It's going to be fun. Some of you guys are going to be our patients. Some of you guys are going to be running scenarios. So I hope you guys are excited. And anytime you guys have questions, please ask. We're here to just exchange and learn from each other. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Captain Joshi from Australian Army. Uh, I'm emergency nurse practitioner by trade. Uh, that's my civilian job. Um, so yeah, I'm here to like get along with these guys, and um, I'll be involving more on T Triple C. So yeah, just uh, learning from Australian and U.S. Army, and with you guys. Hit me through the questions if you guys have any, but. Very excited to be here and see you guys around. Kumusta? <laughs> HM31, uh, General Duty Corpsman, and I've been in the Navy for about seven years, and I'll be uh, assisting uh, teaching T Triple C and DLS. Thank you. Good. Oh, did you try? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am HM2 Van Meter. I've been in the Navy for nine years. I'm a hospital corpsman, which is Combat medic slash, you know, nursing aide. So we'll be teaching DLS and uh, TCCC today. So I look forward to working with you all. Magandang umaga. My name is Alyssa. I'm a um, ER trauma nurse in the Navy for the past five years. Um, I've helped coordinate this 
um, all the classes today. So I'm really looking forward to see how well we interact with one another and um, leading, up, leading up to our big event next week. Magandang umaga. My name is Lieutenant Corey Andrada. My background is a operating room nurse uh, for the US Navy. I'm here today to help out with uh, the hands-on activities that we have planned for you. I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to say, uh, oh, crap. Don't be shy. How do I say that? Wagmangia. <laughs> and also have fun. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Jennifer, Lieutenant Jennifer Perez. I'm ER nurse in the US Navy, and today we're gonna be talking about um, PADAR, um, and uh, I'll be talking to you about later about uh, the triage process for that. So thank you for having us. Is this how you do it? Okay. Yes, oh, it's full play, yeah. Out when I ask, it's full play. Yeah. So, are, are we starting? Again, good musta. Um, I want to start with a video that kind of brings out motivation for you guys. So, who've been to Korea? No? There we go. Um, there's a place called Itaewon. Uh, one year ago, there was like a mass casualty event over there, and there weren't enough uh, firefighters, EMT, police officer to do um, chest compressions. And it's not a good video to see, but hopefully this encourages everyone here to um, kind of be more motivated, more engaging, because it could happen to anybody here. So please. So that's an actual mass cast event. People were crowded, and then they all got uh, stuck together. And what happened was everyone uh, became a cardiac arrest. And as you can see, firefighters, police, EMT, everyone was on hand trying to perform uh, chest compression. But there were too many uh, casualties. So they were asking people, can you do BLS? Can you do chest compression? Unfortunately, at the time, not many people were able to, as you can see from body laying around. So they had to bring other civilians who were nearby to help them do chest compression. So this class is very essential. Yep, now the slide. Okay, so good morning everyone. Like I said, my name is uh, HM2 Van Meter. Uh, so today we'll be talking about basic life support, which is CPR, chest compressions, cardiopulmonary resuscitative, right? So talk about chest compressions, delivering breaths, uh, life-saving interventions, okay? Next. So CPR consists of four main parts, all right? We have our circulation, our airway, and our breathing, as well as the defibrillation. So circulation is gonna be the, like, uh, blood flow, blood carries oxygen, oxygen carries the heart, the muscles, the brain, keeps us alive, correct? Airway, oh. Uh, airway, as we know, when we breathe, we take in oxygen. Oxygen goes to our blood, and it produces throughout the whole body. All right, breathing takes in air, and then defibrillation. We'll be talking about how to use um, an AED, the, how to shock someone properly to restore the heart's cardiac contractility and cardiac function. If I'm going too fast, uh, let me know, and I'll slow down. <laughs> no, right now, no, we'll just say. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, you can play it. Yeah, I'll play it. Let me go back. So this will be a demonstration of what adequate CPR and AD defibrillation looks like. And then we'll have some discussion points about what went wrong, what we could do better, et cetera.
provide high quality chest compressions, you must use correct hand placement and body position, compress at a proper depth and rate, allow for full chest recoil, and minimize interruptions to less than 10 seconds. During chest compressions, proper technique is critical. So first, place the patient on a firm, flat surface. In a healthcare setting, use a bed with a CPR feature or place a CPR board under the patient. Adjust the bed to an appropriate working height or use a step stool. Lower the bed side rails closest to you. In other settings, move the patient to the floor or the ground and kneel beside them. Next, expose the patient's chest so you can ensure proper hand placement and visualize chest recoil. Now, position your hands correctly. Place the heel of one hand in the center of the patient's chest on the lower half of the sternum. Place your other hand on top of the first one and interlace your fingers or hold them up so they don't rest on the patient's chest. Then, position yourself so your shoulders are directly over your hands. This position lets you compress the chest using a straight up and down motion. This is more effective and less tiring. To help keep your arms straight, lock your elbows. For an adult, compress the chest at least 2 inches. If you're using a feedback device, make sure the compressions are no more than 2.4 inches deep. Provide smooth compressions at a rate between 100 to 120 per minute, like this. Allow the chest to fully recoil after each compression. Avoid leaning on the patient's chest at the top of the compression because doing so impedes venous return and prevents the heart from filling completely. This, in turn, decreases cardiac output. Here's what a cycle of compressions looks like. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So key things to remember in that video, right? Elbows locked out. When you, you don't want elbows cocked like this, not, not good, right? Lock your elbows out and count out loud. When we count, when we don't count loud, someone, uh, maybe if you have help, they don't know where you're at. So you have to count one, two, three, four, and everyone knows when you get to 30, then you have completed one cycle of CPR. Does that make sense? So make sure you count out loud your, your every, every time you go. And then, keep going, keep going. All right, so the importance of compressions, oh no, go back. So one important part of CPR is chest compressions, which we talked about, which allows the heart to pump, right? The goal of CPR is we are trying to make sure we can pump the heart, pump blood to the rest of our body, and pump oxygen to our brain and heart. That way, we don't die, right? So we're pretty much manually trying to make the heart pump. That is the goal of CPR. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the techniques of CPR. So we have position yourself at the victim's side, whether that be on a floor. Uh, biggest thing we wanna make sure is that we are on a solid surface. Right? We want hard surface, not soft. So we want a hard surface to where we can get that adequate recoil. All right, make sure the victim is lying on his back on a firm, flat surface, like we said. Move or move all clothing. So make sure you move all clothing. That way you can see your, uh, your landmarks, that you're on proper position of uh, sternum, okay? So biggest thing with uh, removing clothing, right? Men and female, right? Respect privacy, HIPAA. So make sure you are maintaining decency of patient. All right. Put the heel of one hand on the center of the victim's bare chest between the nipples. So you have the nipple line on males. You're going to be center of the nipple line, right on the sternum. If you go too low, as a xiphoid process, it's going to make him throw up and uh, not good, right? If you go too high, you're not going to be able to adequately pump the heart. So you need to be perfectly in the center between the nipple line, okay? All right. Put the heel of your other hand on top of your first hand, so it's going to look like this. Everyone go ahead and do this with me. Lock elbows out and pump. 
straighten your arms and position your shoulders directly over your hands. So your shoulders should be directly over your hands like so. Directly over, just like that. Max, you can go next. Okay. All right, so follow these steps to perform chest compressions on an adult. So right now we're talking about adult patients, not pediatrics, adult, okay? Push hard and fast, press down two to two and a fourth inches uh, with each compression. Now, it's kind of hard to measure two inches, right? It's not, not easy. So what you want to do is just go hard and fast. Don't worry about ribs breaking. Ribs can break, right? If it's better to break a rib and save a life than to not break a rib and lose a life. Does that make sense? So don't be shy to give adequate chest compressions. All right. At the end of each compression, make sure you allow the chest to recoil or expand completely. Full chest recoil allows more blood fill to refill the heart. So our goal here is you're pushing all the way down and all the way up. All the way down, all the way up. If you go too fast, too shallow, then you're not, pop you're not properly allowing the heart to pump blood all throughout the body. All right? So make sure you go all the way down and all the way up. Complete reset. All right? And then we're going to deliver compressions in a smooth fashion at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. Who's heard of the song Staying Alive by Bee Gees? Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Yeah, that's the, that song, that cadence is, uh, yeah, there you go, yeah, see? <laughs> Very good. Uh, that, that cadence, that song, that rhythm, ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. That's going to be your beat. So when you do chest compressions, just sing in your head, Bee Gees. All right, 100 to 120 beats per minute. All right. So rescuers should push hard and deep on the chest like we talked about. All right, rescuers should compress at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute, which is that staying alive by Bee Gees. Rescuers should allow chest to recoil completely after each compression, all the way down, all the way up, reset, all the way down, all the way up, reset. Rescuers should not interrupt chest compressions often or for long. Keep interruptions to less than 10 seconds. So you should never stop compressions for more than 10 seconds. All right? So if you have to do something, go get AD or call EM, uh, EMT or call 911. You should only have, you have 10 seconds to do that. But then you have to go back to chest compressions. Okay? Biggest thing to note with that is you will get tired. CPR is very, very, very tiring. Right? So making sure if you have help, you ask for help and you uh, tr uh, change out positions. So that way, you, when you get tired, you have less adequate CPR. So more tired equals bad CPR. So make sure you're switching out positions. All right. Why is it important for um, shallow chest compressions may not produce adequate blood flow, like we said? This comp uh, the compression rate when we're talking about the beats per minute uh, allows blood flow and survival should improve survival. And then rescuers should allow chest, we're talking about three, so complete chest recoil maximizes refilling of the heart. This is necessary for effective blood flow. Like we said, oxygen is in the blood. When blood is pumped through the heart, then, uh, brain and muscles and lungs, then oxygen is as well. So blood equals oxygen. So we want blood and oxygen. All right. Cool. All right, so I'll be giving it to HM31. He'll be talking about airway maneuvers, how to readjust and reposition airways properly and effectively. Thank you. Right, um, I'm HM31, I'll be going over the airway. So we're gonna go over the learning objectives. Uh, well, number one, perform the head, tail, chin lift. So if you don't open the airway, all that compression is become useless. And we're also gonna talk about trauma jaw thrust because if head, tail, chin lift does not work for that patient because he has a neck injury, then you wanna uh, provide the jaw thrust. And we're gonna talk about giving mouth to mouth breast to the victim. And I know it's nasty because some people don't brush their teeth, just have bad odor, but we're here to save lives. And then give mouth to mask, breast to the victim. So if you're lucky and you have a, a BVM, then you could definitely give air to the victim. Next slide, please. So we're going to go over the head, tail, chin lift uh, technique first. So after the compression, you want to place one hand on the victim's forehead and push with your palm to tilt the head back. And I'll show the video with how you perform such an act. Number two, place the finger of the other hand under the bony part of the lower jaw near the chin. Lift the jaw to the bring to the chin forward. 
So the head tilt chain lift relieves airway obstruction in the unresponsive patient. So think of it like this. If you're in a car for a prolonged period of time, you tend to go to sleep, right? So if you're like this, the airway is obstructed. That's why we want to use this technique to open up the airway because all that compression is useless without, without the open airway. Uh, slide, slide three, please. Opening the airway. To open the patient's airway, use either the head tilt chin lift technique or the modified jaw thrust maneuver. To perform the head tilt chin lift technique on an adult, press down on the forehead with one hand while pulling up on the bony underside of the chin with two or three fingers of the other hand, like this. Then tilt the head to a pass neutral position to open the airway. When a patient has a suspected head, neck, or spinal injury, use the modified jaw thrust maneuver to open the airway. For this maneuver, position yourself above the patient's head. Put one hand on either side of the patient's head with your thumbs near the corners of the mouth and pointed towards the chin. Use your elbows for support, like this. Slide your fingers under the angles of the jawbone without moving the patient's head or neck. Then thrust the jaw up again without moving the head or neck to lift the jaw and open the airway. All right, um, th that shows you uh, uh, how to perform the head tilt chin lift and trauma jaw thrust. I'm going to be handing over a uh, mannequin so you guys all could practice. Head tilt and chin lift. There we go. And then chin lift. As you saw from the video, utilizing head tilt chin lift makes you kind of think about one thing, which is the neck injury. If the patient had a car accident, bang his head really hard, then you do not want to be using the head tilt lift. You might want to use a jaw thrust. Next slide, please. So do not press deeply into the soft tissue under the chin because this might obstruct the airway. Uh, those are the important considerations that you want to think about when you're using the head tilt chin lift. Do not use a thumb to lift the chin. Do not close the victim's mouth completely unless mouth to nose breathing is the technique of choice for the victim. And that is the jaw thrust maneuver that I talked about. That is only for if the patient has a neck injury and you don't want to hurt their neck by moving the airway. So in order to do so, um, it can see Vanley. he's going to demonstrate how to open the airway. We'll use this one. So he's going to position himself at the victim's side so that you are ready to open the airway. As you can see, he's positioning himself next to the airway, a uh, patient. He's going to open the airway using a uh, jaw thrust because this guy had a, a car accident. And he's going to begin giving breath to the victim. And this is a mannequin, so he's going to use a BVM. He's going to use a C, E method to um, hold on to the mask. Attach the BVM. You look how he's doing slowly. You don't want to overventilate or do it really fast. <laughs> he'll he'll vomit. You want the air to go to the chest, not his stomach. Oh, it'll be like volcano. Thank you. Next slide, please. So mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. If you don't have a BVM in most cases, 
Mouth-to-mouth breeding is a quick, effective way to provide oxygen to the victim. Um, even though the oxygen saturation is going to be different from using BVM attached to oxygen tank, it's effective enough to supply the oxygen to the victim's need. Next slide, please. Mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth breeding. Um, we will, do you want to demonstrate? Or? Yeah. Okay. Follow these steps to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth breeding to the victim. So you're going to hold the victim's airway open with a head to chin lift and pinch the nose close with your thumb and index finger using the hand on the forehead. Take a regular but not a deep breath because you don't want them to vomit and seal your lip around the victim's mouth creating an airtight seal. You're going to give one breath for one second and watch for the chest to rise and fall. If the chest does not rise, that means there is some kind of obstruction in the airway. So repeat the head, tail, chin lift. You're going to give a second breath and watch for the chest to rise and fall. Next slide, please. And like I said from the beginning earlier, risk of gastric inflation. During CPR, uh, gastric inflation may develop if you give breath too quickly, as you saw. With too much force, air is likely to enter the stomach and cause gastric inflation. So you want the air to go to the chest, not the stomach. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And um, you want to also use isolation technique because Yeah, I mean, it's in the next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Um, so, the risk of infection from CPR is very low, but we live through COVID era, so please be careful with it. Um, exposure to blood or body fluid is also a consideration. Standard precaution, including barrier device such as a face mask or a BVM when giving breath is recommended, but you got to do when situation dictates. Masks usually have a one-way valve that diverts the exhale air away from the rescuer. Rescuers should replace the face shield with mouse tooth mask or bag mask device at the first opportunity. Next slide, please. Uh, follow these steps to use a mask to give the breath to the victim. Just like he did last time, you're going to position yourself at the victim's side and place a mask on the victim's face using the bridge of the nose as a guide for a correct position. And we're going to show you a video. Pocket mask, yeah. Ooh. OK. So we're going to show you a video using a mouse to mask. <laughs> Pocket mask use. To use a pocket mask, first select an appropriately sized mask and then assemble it like this. Place the mask at the bridge of the nose, then lower it over the patient's nose and mouth, making sure it doesn't extend past the chin. To seal the mask, place the webbing between your index finger and thumb at the top of the mask above the valve, then place your remaining fingers on the side of the patient's face. Now. Place the thumb of your other hand along the base of the mask and place your bent index finger under the patient's chin. Open the airway to pass neutral, take a normal breath, make a complete seal over the mask valve with your mouth, and give two ventilations. Each ventilation should last about one second and make the chest begin to rise. Remember, between ventilations, quickly break the seal and take another breath. All right, um, do not move the victim while CPR is in progress, uh, only when necessary, such as when there's a danger. And vital chest compression will begin sooner 
if the rescuer performed res recitation where they will find the victim. Next slide, please. So to add what he did and what I did, we're going to talk about the compression and ventilation ratio. The lone rescuer should use universal compression ventilation ratio of th th 30 compression to two breaths when giving CPR to a victim of all age except born babies, like neonates. Rescuers should make every effort to deliver breaths efficiently. This will minimize interruption in chest compression, and that minimizing is 10 seconds. You want to make sure that within 10 seconds, you go back to chest compression. When you give chest compression, it's important to press deeply at a rate of about 100 to 120 compression per minute and allow the chest to recoil completely. Yep. And we'll demonstrate. He's going to give 30 compression. He's following the high quality uh, principle. He's letting the chest recoil rise and fall. After 30, he'll give two breaths, making sure that it is sealed. As you saw, less than 10 seconds of interruption of chest compression. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to have one of our uh, Australian counterpart teach one rescue adults PR all in one together. Hello. Morning, everyone. Um, as I said before, this is Captain Joshi from Australia. <coughs> I'm going to bring all the two things together. All right. So the first part, which was uh, doing the CPR, second part was the uh, ventilation part. So we're going to bring those two together and we'll show you how it works all together. All right. So objectives for this one is identify when to start the CPR. All right. So we need to identify first. We don't want to jump on the live person uh, and start CPR. So we need to find out what are the key indicators when to start the CPR. Okay. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and I will show you this um, sequence for one rescuer CPR. So only one person available to do the CPR. Uh, we do differently when we got more help, but if you just by yourself, how are you gonna do that? So that's what we're gonna cover here. Next. Um, yeah, so next, is there, is there a video? Yeah. So just watch the video and we'll go further. When it comes to being effective in an emergency, rapid assessment skills are crucial. First, conduct a quick visual survey. In any emergency, you need to first make sure the environment is safe for you, your team, and anyone else here. When assessing for safety, ask yourself, are any immediate dangers present? What guidance needs to be given to family members who may be present? Next, form your initial impression of the patient. Remember, the initial impression is about suspicion. Ask yourself, does the patient look sick or unresponsive? Does the patient's skin appear pale, mottled, or cyanotic? Do they appear to be breathing? Is there severe, life-threatening bleeding? If there is, immediately stop it with any resources you have available. Then, quickly determine what additional resources are needed. Who is available to help? Do you need any additional equipment, such as an AED? Once you've finished your visual survey, check for responsiveness. This may be obvious from your initial impression. For example, the patient may be able to speak to you, or they may be moaning, crying, or moving around. If they are responsive, obtain consent and provide care as appropriate. However, if the patient appears unresponsive, follow the shout, tap, shout sequence. Are you okay? Mrs. Jones, are you okay? Observe for the patient's response to the stimulus. It may be subtle, some slight movement or momentary eye opening. 
If the patient is unresponsive, shout for somebody to activate the emergency response system and get an AED if you have not already done so. Next, make sure the unresponsive patient is face up. If they are face down, you must roll them onto their back, taking care not to create or worsen a suspected injury. Then, open the airway using the head tilt chin lift technique. Or, use a modified jaw thrust maneuver if a head, neck, or spinal injury is suspected. Simultaneously, check for breathing and a carotid pulse for at least five seconds, but no more than 10. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, 4 1,000, 5 1,000, 6 1,000, 7 1,000, 8 1,000, 9 1,000, 10. Let's break it down now. You check for breathing, look to see if the patient's chest is rising and falling. Also, listen for escaping air and feel for breathing against the side of your cheek. When you're taking the pulse of an adult patient, palpate the carotid artery by sliding two fingers into the groove of the patient's neck. Be careful not to reach across the neck and obstruct the airway. Then, provide care based on the conditions found. All right, so that was pretty good demonstration of doing um, all together. Um, so I'm just gonna go through those things again and just gonna ask you questions uh, on those um, so you guys can understand. So we're gonna do like a two-way communication, not just one way, all right? So if you guys know, answer that question, okay? Um, so the step one, um, in Australia, how we do it, we just do, DRS, A, B, C, D for any B, uh, BLS team. So <clears throat> D is the danger. So the first step is then the, uh, look for the danger. <clears throat> so just think, this is my patient. Can you see any danger around uh, on this patient? Anyone? What kind of danger you can see if I got a patient sitting lying here? Do you think those wires can be danger? Do you think the leveling, like if I'm just standing here and I can fall or is that danger? Or do you think this table, it can be a danger? So I'll look for the danger first, all right? So make sure the patient and you are safe, all right? So uh, even with the patient, if there are too many family members, for example, they can be a danger too, all right? So think about those things, make sure the area is quite secured uh, so you can do your job properly, okay? So think about the danger, make sure the scene is safe and safe for you and the victim, um, and you don't victim be a victim by yourself, all right? Uh, then check for the response. So you guys should know, check for the response. How are you gonna check the response? Tap, hey, hey, how are you? Yeah, are you awake? What's your name? Uh, if it's not responsive to that, I'm going to squeeze the trapezius or uh, get the like sternal rub. It's quite a painful thing. So um, if they are not responding to verbal, then they will respond to the pain. And the last one is whether they are responsive or unresponsive. So you do the alert, verbal command, um, response to the pain, and unresponsive. So A, full, yeah? So that's the first step. Make sure there is no danger and um, see whether a patient is uh, responsive. Uh, then third step, a second step, is send for the help. So if you are in a, if you are alone, and if you find the patient is unresponsive, shout for the help. So help, yeah. Um, if you are in the hospital, you just press the hospital emergency button. Uh, if you are in a community, uh, there should be like emergency helpline. You can just call on that one, yeah? So that's for activating emergency response. Um, and then as soon as you activate the response, you need to start CPR. You don't wanna delay starting the CPR, okay? So you jump on the patient, sorry. Um, before that, you check pulse. So check the pulse. What kind of pulse are we gonna check? Anyone? Carotid, yes, definitely. How are we gonna check it? Where is the carotid? Can everyone show me quickly? Which side, right side, left side? 
both sides. <laughs> yeah, so just checking you guys. Uh, so checking pterotypos. Um, I'll just on the next next slide. I'll show you how to check the how to locate uh, pterotypos. Um, but why we do it? It's easier and requires less pressure to perform, and uh, it's near to the patient's head, so we can just like see what's going on with the patient. Um, while checking for the pulse, look for the breath as well as shown on the video. Okay, so now checking for the pulse. So make sure um, maintain a head tilt. So make sure it's not like bunching up or too far down. That's just gonna stretch. Um, get two or three fingers just next to or one side of the. Uh, look at the trachea first, and just slide it down on the neck groove, and should be able to feel the carotid pulse. It's nice and strong, and it's quite reliable. Yeah. So any side, look at the trachea first. And then either side, just go in a little bit of grow there. You should be able to feel your carotid pulse easily. All right. So palpate the artery and establish that if there is a pulse or no pulse. All right. So if no pulse, no breathing, no response, that's when you're going to start the CPR. Next slide. Uh, so what is the ratio for CPR? 30 to 2, yes, so 30 compression and 2 breathe after that, then 30 uh, compression after that, 2 breathe. Uh, make sure you deliver that breathe eff efficiently uh, and minimize the interruptions. So if you're just by yourself, I know it's hard, but that CPR is going to save the life, all right? So minimize the interruption, make sure your um, help is on the way or... Um, Try to get, if, if there is no help available, just try to get that help uh, come earlier than later. Compress at the right depth and the right at about 100 to 120 compression per minute. So uh, as I explained earlier, hard and fast, all right? Um, and make sure you give those um, uh, breaths appropriately. Make sure uh, you try to get that chest recoiled properly as well after that. Next slide. Uh, if, you, if you're not sure, for example, you try to look at the pulse on the both side, and if you are not sure whether the patient has got a pulse or not, but if they have no response, no breathing, then you should start the CPR as soon as possible. Yeah? Unnecessary, uh, unnecessary CPR is less harmful than uh, no CPR. So when patient need it, when the victim needs it, then you should start the CPR. All right, I'll hand on to the next slide. Thank you, guys. Ooh. Okay, so now me and 3 Juan will just be showing you a quick demo on what the full thing is going to look like. Then we're going to break off into lanes. We'll have six mannequins, choose an instructor, and then we'll show you, you'll get hands on to try, okay? All right, so like Sir said, Scene safety, is my scene safe, right? Is there fire, is there electric hazard, is there, um, is there a knife, you know, robbery? Safety, scene safety, hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Wake up, no response, okay? So then, we're going to feel for carotid. Everyone show me your carotid. Everyone show me carotid, yeah. Everyone knows where carotid is? Awesome, so we're going to look for carotid and look for breathing, okay? Let's say no, no carotid, no breathing, we do what? CPR. Before we start CPR, what do we want to activate? What do we want to reach out to and ask for help, right? EMT, 911, uh, firefighter, someone, police, anyone who has, hey, is anyone CPR certified? I need help. And then begin, okay? So go ahead and begin. Yeah, just do the start sh compressions. So start showing me compressions. All right, so he'll begin his compressions. Everyone go ahead and sing. Ah, 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 staying alive. <laughs> Someone, ah, ah, staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 staying alive, 
Staying alive. No, just, all right, so he does his 30. Head tilt, chin lift. And then he'll give his two rescue breaths. One. Oh, he actually put his mouth on. One. Then one more. Two. Remember, 30 compressions, two breaths, okay? So then he goes again. He's going to keep going until either help arrives or uh, doctor arrives. So help arrives. You're going to keep going. <laughs> All right. And then let's say he wakes up. He breathes, starts breathing. <gasps> what happened? What happened? What happened? Am I okay? Hey, you're okay. It's okay. Then we stop CPR, okay? Any questions? Now, if uh, you do not have help, let's say AED, let's say you keep doing chest compressions and he's not waking up. We're going to do AED. We're going to shock his heart, okay? Does everyone know AED? Defibrillator, okay? So we're going to show you on mannequin where to put the pads, all right? Very important that you know two things or multiple things. Pads cannot touch. Pads cannot touch at all, okay? Uh, piercings, metal piercings, uh, anything, not good. No pad on metal piercing. Um, pacemaker, do you know what pacemaker is? Yeah, right? Pacemaker, do not place on pacemaker. Any surgical devices, pad does not go on surgical devices. So piercings, no piercings, no surgical devices, and pads cannot touch, okay? All right, so he's going to show you the pl proper placement. Oh, okay, then yeah, you can show it. So on each pad, you will see it'll give you anatomical locations. So if you look, it'll show you center of chest and then the back of shoulder. And we'll pass back, right? And then on top of it, does it have Maybe. the thing? Yeah, that's what they want. What? Oh, I see. It'll have a target patch for your compressions for center sternum. Most every patch is different. So know yours, right? If you are in the Philippines, open AED, look at the pads, get accustomed to the AED pads. Every pad is different, but those three rules always apply, okay? No, no piercings, no surgical devices, and pads cannot touch. All right, what's, what are the three rules? Give me one. Pads can't touch. No piercings. No surgical devices. There you go. She's shy. She's shy. <laughs> All right. Any questions on AED? And then it will talk to you. It'll talk, shock advised, et cetera. We don't have one, but it will it will talk to you and it will guide you through it. So we're gonna go ahead and break off into groups. If uh, I can get six instructors down here, we're gonna do six lanes. Can I get all of the mannequins, please? All of the mannequins. So just set up. We'll just do them right here. If everyone wants to come up, get on a lane. We'll take six at a time. Right here. Two right here. Two right here. Is that all the mannequins? All the masks? All masks? Can I get the mask right here? Thank you. Okay, everyone, come stand up, find instructor. Come on, don't be shy. Come, come. Come here, come here, come here. It's okay, it's okay. Make a line. Make a line, make a line, make a line. Make a line. Don't be shy, don't be shy. We don't bite. There you go, come, come on, come on, come on. There you go, don't be shy. All right, make lines, make lines, make lines. Right here, right here. Right there, make a line right here. Some of you over here, right here. Right there, yeah, come over here. You right here? All right, come here. Come here, don't be shy. And then some of you over here, please, right here.
Hello, everyone. If you don't mind taking your seats, we continue with lecture proper now. But good fo more photo ops. Don't worry. More, more photo ops later. <laughs> don't take my mannequin. So good morning, everyone. Um, so the, this next section will be covered is tactical combat casualty care. So my role when uh, deployed is combat medic as well as HM31 and any other equipment. So we'll be teaching combat medicine now or expeditionary medicine or nurses. Um, so what this section is going to cover is very, how do I say, like um, you have no help. Like you're in an earthquake or, you know, humanitarian, something where hospital is not nearby and it's just you on the scene. So it's gonna focus a lot on danger and um, life-saving interventions, okay? So a lot of emergency medicine now and a lot of trauma. So go ahead, you can play now. Medical emergency, medical emergency. Break out, turn to get on him. So as motivating as that was, right, wh what that means is for you, this is medicine. I call it um, redneck medicine, but yeah, it's like, um, like, how do I say, like jerry-rigged? Like, um, like you have to improvise. Philippines are good at adapting right, and very resourceful. So using what you have available to save a life, right? This is what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, you can go next. I forgot my glasses. All right. All right, you can go skip. So this is going to be first aid, first aid. We got five life-saving skills we're going to teach you today. Um, it's going to be stopping the bleed, managing airway, um, trying to manage shock, and hypothermia prevention, okay? And we'll be talking about it. So these are the four tiers. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. Don't worry about it. All right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Keep going. All right, so this is three phases. So we have care under fire. For you, it'll be threat. So anytime, like danger, right? We're talking about scene safety and BLS, same thing in TCCC. 
So scene safety is going to be paramount in, in, this, in this course, all right? This is under the impression that it's been like a, hur a earthquake, hurricane, typhoon, power lines are in water, um, fires, etc. So very dangerous scenarios, okay? So scene safety, very paramount in this course. From there, we, once we drag him to safety or get him out, to, out of danger into safety, then we go into what's called tactical field care. This is just, you're, you still don't have a hospital near you, it's still just you, but you're out of the danger zone, okay? And then from there, it's gonna be tactical evacuation care. What that is saying is you have successfully done everything you can do for this person to save their life, and now you're just waiting for EMTs or firefighters or hospitals. Does that make sense? All right. So this is the biggest things we're gonna be focused on in care under fire. So like I said, scene safety, uh, using available resources to ensure scene safety, never attempt to rescue someone when the scene is not safe, right? The reason being is if the scene is not safe and you go try to help, now you, you're a casualty. Now there's two patients. Does that make sense? All right. So hasty tourniquet, uh, tur who does, who's seen a tourniquet before? Here. Do we have, what? Yeah. So hasty tourniquet, a tourniquet is something, So a tourniquet is something to cut off blood flow, all right? So tourniquets are used to save, like, life-saving interventions, all right? You, there you go. You can go ahead and pass that on. We'll talk more about tourniquets and the importance of a tourniquet, all right? And then casualty movement. So how to safely move someone without hurting you and without hurting the casualty. And then communication. Communication is very important in medicine, right? That's why in BLS you say one, two, three, four. So you're communicating to everyone where you're at. So communication's huge, all right? So we're gonna focus a lot on communication. When the EMT arrives, hey, this is what I did. Uh, he has laceration on leg, broken ankle, telling them everything that you did and everything that you saw, okay? So this is gonna be our assessment, all right? March, M-A-R-C-H, all right? This is, go ahead and write this down, or take a photo. This is going to be your number one priority to least priority, okay? So someone can bleed to death in under three minutes. So someone with massive bleeding can die in three minutes. So that's going to be our number one priority. That's what we're going to address first, okay? Bleeding, massive bleeding. From there, the next thing that's going to kill someone is not being able to breathe properly, right? You can go about five to six minutes without oxygen to your brain before your brain starts to die. So time critical, right? We want to make sure we can get air taking into the lungs, so that way his brain is staying alive, all right? So I'm making sure those two are gonna be our biggest priorities, all right? From there, we're gonna be focused on respirations and breathing, so his lungs, all right? Any, are his lungs working effectively? Are they, you know, one rising, one not rising? Are they unilateral, uh, are anything wrong? Is it collapsed lung? And then circulation, circulation is just referring to shock. Does everyone know shock? Shock, hypovolemic shock, shock, any kind of shock? There's no, no shock. We'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, and hypothermia. Hypothermia, very cold. When you're cold, your body does not hold clots. Your body, when you're bleeding, you're like, uh, let's say I get paper cut. The only reason I stop bleeding is because my body creates a clot, right? So when we're cold, really cold, our body does not make clots very well. So making sure we treat hypothermia fast. Okay, so, so these are some of the supplies you'll be seeing in uh, this course, right? We have um, the JFAC Joint First Aid Kit or IFAC Individual First Aid Kit, pretty much just any first aid kit. Um, and then it's got a tourniquet. We got a hemostatic dressing. Hemostatic dressing is just like a, a pressure dressing, such as this right here. Boom. It's just a piece of gauze, big piece of gauze with ACE bandage. You wrap tight to allow pressure for bleeding control. There you go, pass that up. And then, uh, yep, keep going. There you go. Go. And then massive hemorrhage will be covered by Lieutenant Puyer. Puyer. So massive bleeding is number one priority, remember. Um, LT, our nurse, trauma nurse, she'll be covering a very, very knowledgeable, very smart.
fine, as long as you're okay. Hi, good morning again. I'm Lieutenant Payer, one of the nurses here. Um, so we're going to talk about massive hemorrhage. Obviously, massive hemorrhage is bad, right? Uh, HM2 just said, how fast can you bleed out? How many minutes? So your patient dies. Three, right? That's not a very long time, especially if they're bleeding out in front of you. It can be kind of scary. So the first thing we want to do after to make sure the scene is safe is stop the bleeding. Uh, what's the difference between an arterial bleed and a venous bleed? Say again. bleed out faster from? An arterial bleed or a venous bleed? Arterial bleed, right? So if you see this bright red spurting blood that has the pulse to it, good indication that you've got an arterial bleed there. Also, if you come across someone and just laying in a huge puddle of blood, right, they probably lost a lot of blood, pretty self-explanatory. And anytime you see an amputation, arm, legs, any extremities, you're worried about blood loss. All right. Next slide. Thank you. So there's three tools. We have a tourniquet, which you guys passed around. We'll have you guys put that on. When I put a tourniquet on, what's a good way to check to see if I put it on tight enough? What do I want to occlude with a tourniquet? Say again? Someone said it. I heard it. Huh? Yes, your pulse. That's exactly right. That's what you're trying to do. So when you practice on yourself or if you're practicing on a friend, if I put it on the arm, I should not be able to feel my radial pulse, right? I've occluded off that artery, which means if I had an amputated arm, I would have stopped the bleeding. So that's exactly right. That's what we're looking for. Hemostatic dressings, I think they've already passed them around. We'll have you guys practice some packing. Um, we've got gauze, and there's certain ways you can do. You want to pack it in. All you're trying to do is tamponade off that massive bleed that you have, right, by applying pressure into the wound. You can put a lot of gauze in small wounds, but that's a good thing because you just want to stop that bleeding. And then we have a pressure bandage, which I think one of you has going around. Again, it's the exact same principle. All we're trying to do is stop the bleeding however we can. Like HM2 is saying, you guys can get creative on how you do this. If you understand what you're trying to do, there's lots of resources out in the community you can use to stop if you don't have a tourniquet. The tourniquet, perfect. This just explains the parts. You don't have to be um, super crazy about it. When we get up here to work with you, we'll show you some ways that you can make a improvised tourniquet. Um, so if you don't have a cat tourniquet, there's lots of things you guys can use. You can use belts, pieces of cloth, all sorts of stuff. Oh, thank you. I was just asking. Huh? Say what? Say it right up here. Um, so you guys will get the chance to, to hang out with this. Um, do you want to show them now? Or? You can show them on me. We'll just show you really quickly how to apply a tourniquet. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Um, so with this, you have a hard plastic back here. We like to put this over where your arteries and your veins are. This is a windlass. All it's going to do is crank it down nice and tight. So here is your buckle that we're going to loop it through and get it nice and tight. Okay. Um, and then we lock it in. And a big thing we always put on is time. Okay, we always know I want to know what time your tourniquet went off. Sorry, that's just good. Yeah. So he's going to put it on me. I'm going to let him do it tight. We're going to see if he did a good job. I'll have one of you check my pulse. <laughs> so good tourniquet equals no pulse. Yeah, yeah that's fine. You do not want any pulse caps in there. So when you first apply it, you're going to yank this strap down really hard, okay? Um, you're going to pull it down nice and tight. This first pull is very crucial with a tourniquet. If you don't get your first pull tight enough, you will not be able to cut off the pulse. You can twist and twist and twist, and you will still have a pulse. <laughs> no, no, go. So you can loop the strap around. All right, when he's gone, I'm going to check my pulse. See how he did. <laughs> and then he would put the time on, right? 
All right. Go ahead and check my radio pulse. Do I have one? I think I can't feel any pulse. <laughs> no pulse or pulse? No, I. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, no. No. no pulse. All right, very good. <laughs> So he would go ahead and write the time on, right? And then at this point, I'm no longer bleeding out. Massive hemorrhage is controlled. Perfect. All right. There we go. Woo. All right. It will make your hand start to go numb. It is painful when you put it on. So don't be surprised if you're putting it on your patient and they're yelling at you to stop. Don't stop till the blood stops, okay? Um, it doesn't feel good for a reason, right? We're occluding all our blood flow, so it's not going to feel great. Um, but it will save their life, and that's an important, that's the most important part is that we're saving their life. So that's a great way to do it. Tourniquet application. Um, we typically like to do it within one minute to stop the bleed that we have. Um, we do what's called high and tight. So if you're in an emergency situation, you're just going to go high and tight on the limb. So you saw HM3 went up by my armpit. Doesn't matter where the injury is, just go high. If it's a leg, you can go high. You can see HM2 and meter, he has his tourniquet high up on his arm, okay? We just go high and tight to stop the bleeding. I'm not gonna take time to find out exactly where you're bleeding from. I just want you to stop bleeding so you live. Um, in some instances, if you have a deliberate time and you can see it, you can go to two to three inches above your wound. You may see that more in a hospital setting where it's a little bit more controlled. But in a mass casualty, just go high and tight and you'll be good to go. So, all right. So, common errors that we see. That first pull, when you saw HM3 put his whole body weight behind it, if you don't do that pull tight enough, doesn't matter how much you twist the windlass, you'll never get it tight enough, okay? Um, the windlass rod, you saw me probably wincing as he was tightening that down. If you don't make that tight enough, you'll still leak blood, and you'll see your patient is still oozing. It may not be pulsating, but they're still losing blood. All right, and then if we don't apply the tourniquet fast enough. We like to do tourniquet drills and race each other on how fast we can get a tourniquet on. Faster we stop the bleed, the better it is for our patient. So. All right, when you're using an improvised tourniquet, um, if you can, pack the wound and hold direct pressure, right? Direct pressure is a great way to stop bleeding. Um, if you're using an improvised tourniquet, there is the possibility you can injure the skin, okay? You want to make sure that an improvised tourniquet is at least about two inches wide. Think about if you just took a shoestring and tied it as tight as you could around the arm. A lot of damage, right, to your tissue. So we're not trying to cause more damage to our patients. Um, you also could make bleeding worse if you don't have a, a good improvised tourniquet. Um, you may not completely control it, so your patient will still bleed out, unfortunately. Um, and then with improvised tourniquets, you want to check it frequently because it's much more likely to loosen over time. So these two are going to show you an improvised tourniquet. Perfect. So you can see how HM2 used supplies around him to create all the same aspects of a tourniquet and it works. But you also saw how sometimes your material isn't strong enough and your stick will break. 
All right, so another method that we <laughs> commonly use is um, direct pressure and wound packing. We do have some things for you to pack right here. Hemostatic dressing, um, HM2, will you be my fingers, please? Um, big thing when we're doing wound packing is you actually want to get your finger right in there in the wound, okay? Don't be shy because you want to find out where that wound is bleeding. Oh, up the movers? Yeah. Um, so you're actually going to get your finger in the wound and find where it's bleeding and tamponade it off, okay? This is going to be our wound. This is wound. Blood. <laughs> blood is spurting. So HM2 is going to stick his finger in there and tamponade off the blood. Now at this point, he's going to have his gauze, okay? We like to form a little bit of a ball at the end, okay? Yeah, this is one hand. You're going to get your dexterity going, okay? Now he's going to replace his thumb with that ball, keeping pressure. He's going to start a two-finger packing method, okay? For you. And what the whole point is is that you're never releasing pressure on the bleeding site, okay? You're just constantly shoving in more and more gauze. You can be surprised at how much gauze you can get in the wound. And the reason that we're doing this is we want to stop that bleed. If we don't pack it tight at the bottom, all that will happen is the patient will just bleed, okay? Um, and then you hold pressure, okay? Hold pressure for three minutes, direct pressure. It can take a lot of time and a lot of energy. This part will help the clot forming and uh, help stop the bleeding, like Agent 2 was talking about. So very important. Um, we'll have pool noodles for you guys to try. <laughs> uh, we'll do it in a second. Actually, yeah, we can do it now. Um, the other way is the H bandage, which is floating around here somewhere. Bandage. So I'll have HM2 show you how to do um, a pressure bandage on myself. He can show you a couple different ways. These are very common in first aid kits, so you'll come across them. The principle is exactly the same, though. We're applying direct pressure, right, to our wound. Do you want to do an arm or a leg? Okay. Do you want to show junctional? Yeah. Okay. So this is a good tool if we're doing what's called junctional. If I'm talking about a junctional injury, where's my injury going to be located? Where's a junctional injury? <laughs> right? Armpits in the groin, that kind of stuff, right? So those weird places where you're, like, not quite sure how you can get things in, He's going to show you a great way to treat a junctional wound. So let's say it's in, uh, let's say, a piece of metal or something, rock has penetrated her armpit, and she's bleeding, right? It's too high for a tourniquet, so you need to pack and wrap it, right? So you're going to use this kind of dressing, push up, and begin wrapping. Make sure you wrap up into, up into the wound. So every time he comes up under my armpit, he's pulling that dressing up tighter and tighter, okay? That's going to help apply that direct pressure. He's using my body to help him use direct pressure, right? He's locking in his dressing on this side so that it's less likely to slip off, right? I'm using my body to create tension on my own wound. Please do not go around the neck. <laughs> no bueno. <laughs> Don't choke your patient. <laughs> and then this is another example of something that you can easily create out of a lot of different things that would naturally be in your environment. Again, the whole idea is we just want to put direct pressure on whatever your wound space is. Yep, you can use lots of different hard things. You can use things like this to put down and create um, a hard surface to wrap against. I've used rocks before where I've packed a wound, put a rock over it, and then pressure dressing. Uh, sometimes you just have to get creative, but you can save lives by getting creative. So we have the pool noodles floating around. Um, you guys are going to find your wound, okay? Those of you who have it, do you guys have all have gauze with the pool? Okay. Um, so again, the, oops, that's a big piece of gauze. So the big thing that you're going to do is find your wound. 
I'm going to stick my finger in because I'm also like, hey, is this a tunneling wound, right? Where does it go? I'm going to get right in there, tamponade off my bleed. Now I've got my gauze. I'm going to create a little bit of a knot, a little bit of a ball, okay? My goal is to always have pressure on my wound. So sometimes this is an advantage for those of us who have smaller hands because we can really get our fingers in there, okay? I'm going to press in and replace my finger, maintaining pressure. What I like to do, there's a couple different techniques. Now I have my gauze in. I like to wrap my finger around and I replace, okay? Wrap my finger, replace. I can get a lot of gauze in there pretty fast. Wrap it around your finger, replace it in. And I am just stuffing it in until I cannot stuff anymore, okay? And then at that point, how many minutes do I hold direct pressure for? Three minutes, right? How fast can your patient bleed out? Three minutes makes it easy, right? Three minutes is our key. If I put on a tourniquet, what am I checking for? It's on. Pulse. Pulse. And if it's a full amputation, what do I want to make sure I don't see after I put my tourniquet on? Right. I want to make sure that the bleeding has stopped. So, perfect. We'll have you guys practice with the, the pool tools with packing, and then we'll go on to the next one. Any questions? All right, next slide, please. So no matter how much blood you stop, if you don't uh, open the airway, they're gone. So I'm going to show you the uh, sign and symptom of airway obstruction. It could be in distress, indicating that they cannot breathe, like <laughs> <laughs> Casualty is making a snoring or gargling sound that um, suggests that there's something in their airway. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll see like a visible blood or foreign object present in the airway, like when you open the mouth. Uh, we have a mnemonic for that. It's called uh, LOBS, uh, like laceration, obstruction, broken teeth, burn, swelling, etc. Or just severe trauma to the face where your half the face is gone. So from the BLS, we're going to talk about head, tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. So. If the patient had a head injury, uh, which one would you use? Injury. Would you use a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust? Anyone? You guys are so smart. Uh, if the patient is conscious, help them assume any position that they feel comfortable with, like that right here. Or if they're unconscious, you could put them in a recovery position because they could be vomiting, and that could occlude the airway. Okay, respiration. Assess for respiratory distress, and those are the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, which include difficulty breathing, like <gasps> starting to get air in and out. Breathing is weak, like six times per minute, or they're rapidly uh, breathing, 20 times per minute. Also, any uh, injury on the chest may indicate uh, sign and symptom. You could also uh, go back to that. Yeah. You could also look at the surrounding, like BLS scene safety. If there are burning smoke, expect patient to have respiratory distress from inhaling all that smoke. Assess for a potential life-threatening chest injuries, such as penetration, a blast, and if there's a penetration wound, make sure you look at the back for any exit wound. Remember. When we learn about wound packing, do not pack anything on the torso area because it's too big of a cavity to fill it in. And if you put it inside the chest, it will kind of affect the way the lung expand. And also report a severe injury, like chest injury, to the medical personnel because if you don't say anything, you keep the secret, okay? Did you want to? Next slide is circulation. Circulation, uh, circulation means like obviously the bleeding. You want to stop bleeding, isn't it? So um, how are we going to uh, stop bleeding and that way that we prevent the shock, all right? So if somebody is bleeding, uh, it's going to turn into shock and then it's, it's going to turn into like obviously how to save the life. 
So uh, assess all bleed, um, bleeding control measures. Um, means make sure you, uh, first of all, apply those tunicates and it's working, all right? If you applied any of those bracing, uh, gauze, um, make sure they are working. If not working, can reapply it. Uh, with the tunicate, you don't want to take it off, all right? If it is not uh, effective, then you want to put another tunicate um, more proximal to that part, okay? Um, check for the pose, make sure there's no pose um, on the side where you got the tunicate, but make sure there's a pose on the other side, make sure there's a signs of life, okay? Uh, signs and symptoms of shock, which is rapid breathing, losing focus and having difficulty in engaging. So a bit of delirium, like if not with you, losing focus, might more like a fainting kind of thing. Uh, looks quite diaphoretic, like sweaty, cool and clammy skin, um, and pale and gray skin. All right, so those are the signs of the shock. It means you are not getting proper perfusion on the skin. Your blood is not, not getting down all the way to the uh, still part of the body. So that's a sign of the shock. So look for those uh, symptoms and treat those. Next slide. H. Uh, prevent and address hypothermia. Uh, which can be worsened by the massive blood loss. So when you lose the blood, uh, your temperature regular si regulation system doesn't work well. Um, so you need to control and uh, put some measures to um, address hypothermia, which keep the clothing on, uh, on the uh, casualty, extremely, uh, unless it's extremely wet, and then remove. So make sure you got the clothing on. If it is wet, then remove it and make sure warm it, uh, warm them. Cover the casualty with the blankets, um, poncho liners, sleeping bags, or anything you got. And keep the casualty off the ground. The signs and symptoms of hypothermia are just there, slurred speech, mumbling, slow breathing, drowsiness, and shivering. Obviously, when you are cold, you shiver. Your body is trying to uh, raise the temperature. Yeah, so look for those symptoms and try to prevent those hypothermia symptoms. Any questions? Any questions? All right. The next part. All right. All right. So I'm just going to go through some of the other stuff, uh, which will be eye trauma, head injury, burns, and fractures. So what we can do if we got the victims with those injuries. So eye injury, obviously, um, would be obvious when you look at the face, if there is injury around the eye, if there is any bleeding, if the patient is say, saying that I can't see, um, make sure you cover with the patch. So we should have in the first aid kit a uh, rigid patch. I don't know. But just place that rigid patch, eye patch, and cover that. Um, a lot of time, if you got an injury on one side, then you try cover the other, uh, other eye as well. Because when you move one eye, the other eye is going to move too. Yeah? So if you got an injury on the one side, it is going to co cover on the other side too. Burns, common and very common injury, yeah? Uh, so they're classified by the depth of the wound. So there is a superficial burn, superficial partial thickness burn. So in Australia, we say first degree, second degree, third degree, all right? The level, uh, layer of the skin involved in the burn. The su superficial, as you can see, it's just like erythema, so redness on the skin. That's a superficial burn. It's like a turn burn, yeah? Uh, second one, as you can see, it's like formed blister, like fluid-filled blister. So it's a 
uh, partial thickness burn. Um, that second one would be the most painful burns, okay? So they are in the um, nerves on the layer of the skin, and they can be quite painful. So that's the second degree burn. Full thickness, thickness burn, they are third degree burn. Um, it looks like really bad, it looks dry, stiff. Um, you can see a little bit of scar, like whitish uh, on that burn as well. That could be the third, third degree burn. So it could be like, yeah, as, as I said, white, brown, or black. So as you see on the picture, uh, that's the worst kind of the burn. Next slide. Burn care. How are we going to look after the burn? Um, cover the burn area with a dry, sterile dressing. So whatever the dressing you got, just try to cover it. Simply you want to cover it because um, it can be quite painful. Uh, you don't want to keep it open. The air touching the burn, it can be quite painful. Uh, cover the casualty to prevent the loss and keep, uh, keep them dry. So when you're losing the superficial layer of the skin, then there is no protection on your body parts. So you can easily lose the heat and you can get the uh, hypothermia. So you want to make sure you prevent the heat loss. Yeah. In case of electrical injury, make sure you secure the power if possible. Otherwise, remove the casualty from the electrical source using non-conductive objects such as rubber wooden stick or uh, so whatever you got available there and move the casualty to the safe place. So it's like a, make sure you're safe and the victim is safe. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. So we'll be talking about fractures now. So as you can see, one's open, one's closed, right? One's pretty gruesome, and one's not as bad, all right? So warning signs of a fractures are significant swelling, an audible perceived nap, right? The bone snapping in half, different length or shape of limb. If you have your arms and one looks like that, it's probably broken, all right? Loss of pulse or sensation. Everyone know where your pulses are? Show me radial pulse. Radial pulse, show me radial pulse. Do we check with two fingers or a thumb? Two fingers, right? Show me carotid pulse. Show me brachial. Show me femoral. I can't, can't, I can't see you. <laughs> all right, but yeah, check, always check pulses, right? Before and after doing anything, always, always, always check pulses, okay? All right, and then crepitus. Who knows what crepitus sounds like? Like, <laughs> like that crunch, crunching of bones, right? No, no good. Sounds gross. Actually, can you come back real quick? So biggest thing with closed fractures, uh, looks, it looks like a sprain kind of. So a closed fracture can also look like a sprain sometimes. So make sure you, you check you check pulses, all of these things to make sure it's a fracture or if it's a sprain. Okay? Two different treatments, but appear similar. All right. So application of a splint. So a splint is anything rigid such as like sticks, um, you know, sticks, stuff like that, anything that you can to secure the bone. So a splint is used to prevent movement, holding an injured arm or leg in place. Kind of like right here, we have the, the hand. You use bulky materials such as boards, boxes, tree limbs, uh, and even what, not weapons, but you know, like a rebar, you know, like um, the, the fence posts, stuff like that, um, sheet metal, anything you have to your disposable. All right, incorporate the, boy, uh, oh, there you go. So this is a malleable splint. So this is can be formed. I don't know how to hold this. Can you like mess with it while? So it can be formed to make it more rigid. And what's nice about this, let me see this one. These things, so this is called a SAM splint, all right? What's nice about these is right here, it has a map where it shows you what kind of splint you can use. So it teaches you how to use a splint and how to properly secure it. So I pass that to you and you can go ahead and pass it around. So the way this is gonna work, you know, you fold it, you mold it to the good arm. So if this is his broken arm, I don't use this to mold, right? We don't want to use that at all. So I'm going to come over and use his good arm to mold and then come back over and place on the bad arm and then wrap. Does that make sense? We always go bottom to up when wrapping. Does anybody know why? 
Does anybody know why we go bottom to top? What? Of course, right? Promote blood circulation, right? In any kind of thing, we're worried about, um, does he need his hand to survive? <laughs> Can he live without hand? Yes, right? Can he live without his brain working? What about heart? What about abdomen? Liver? Kidney? No, right? So we want all the blood in trauma, all of the blood to circulate uh, vital organs. So brain, heart, abdomen, right? We can live without legs and arms, but we need this to survive. So in trauma, we're making sure blood is carrying oxygen all to vital organs. Does that make sense? Cool. Thank you for your service. All right, so arm fractures. So once you splint it with the like, um, metal or SAM splint, now we need to make sure that it's not moving, right? We want to make sure it's secured and is moving, not moving as much as possible. So for uh, if you wear a polo or, you know, this really doesn't apply to you because y'all are not military uniform. Go ahead and pull it down. But being resourceful, right? So our uniforms have buttons. This is right here. So now he's splinted, right? If not, you have um, safety pins, right? Sewing pins, you can sp splint to shirt. Now all we need to do, I don't have anything like any long gauze, but now we just need to secure this movement. So maybe duct tape, string, wire, something to where this is not moving. Does that make sense? All right, thank you for your service. <laughs> Say thank you, Juan. Woo, <laughs> all right. Um, and then every time we splint, before, what is one thing we check? Pulse, right? Always check pulse below. So if my elbow or my, my um, fucking, I freaking, what is it? No, what is the, the bone? Uh, humerus, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> if my humerus is broken, I want to check below my humerus, right? So I want to check my radial pulse. Because if this is broken, it might be clamping off on artery and I won't be getting pulse. Not good, right? If I don't get pulse down here, that means my arm could die off, right? If we're not getting pulse, that means we're not getting blood to muscles, and if muscles go six plus hours with no oxygen, they die, has to be amputated, right? Cool. All right, so we're gonna assess for head injuries, okay? So how are we gonna assess for head injuries? It's just a quick glance. We're gonna be looking over, making sure um, if they, you know, motor vehicle accident or earthquake and they fall, something like that, making sure that they don't have head injury on the brain, okay? So usually gunshot wounds, stabbings, or fragmentations, this is more so talking about like maybe gas explosion, something like that, all right? Um, so what we're going to be focused on are these signs and symptoms. Altered consciousness, so if he's confused, disorientation or dizziness, headaches, ear ringing, amnesia, nausea and vomiting, and double vision. All of those signs and symptoms, high indication, if not positive indication for head injury, right? We want to monitor, because what can happen if brain injury goes on too long, then we get increased pressure and they could die, or parts of the brain could die off, right? Oh, come back. So important little note, always report signs and symptoms of head injury to medical personnel at the scene. So. The one thing that you must pass off, right? Let's say you're a nurse in um, Robinson's and EMT comes to help out. You need to make sure you pass off what you saw on head because is it easy to get overlooked? Is it easy to miss? Yes, right? If I have uh, blood everywhere, we tend to focus on the blood because it's gross and it's in your face. But what we tend to forget is that the brain is also very important and is not as it's distracting, right? We get distracted by the blood and forget that the head is in trouble. So making sure you pass that off. And this is just, we're going to be talking about communication. Um, this is like a military card. Don't worry too much about it. But biggest thing for y'all is to communicate, right? Medic in the medical field, communication is key. Between nurses and doctor, between nurse aide and nurse, between patient and nurse, communication is always going to be key. So making sure whatever you found and whatever you've done, you pass off to the next person. Told them everything you did, okay? It's a, a misreport or like turnover, right? Nurse turnover. 
All right. So test on knowledge. Uh, so let's say we have this. We, we have this casualty. We have. You have encountered an active shooter situation. An unconscious casualty has sustained multiple gunshot wounds. Your assessment reveals the following: two open chest wounds, so two penetrating chest wounds, from apparent gunshots, and bright red splurting blood from the lower right thigh. The casualty is respiratory distress. So he has respiratory distress, two gunshot wounds, and bright red splurting blood coming from his thigh. Which one takes press? Which one's most number one priority? Huh? I can't hear you. Let's be loud. Ah, uh, what do you guys like? Huh? Massive bleeding. Yes, right. Massive bleeding. Right. Is airway, it takes three, uh, five to six minutes to be in danger, right? Bleeding takes how long to die? Three minutes, right? So what should take precedence? Bleeding or airway? Bleeding, bleeding, airway. Remember, arch, MA, massive hemorrhage, airway, respirations, circulations, head and hypothermia. That is the number one priority going down. Does that make sense? All right. So with that being said, come back. Once we have addressed the massive hemorrhage, the bleeding, what's our next priority? Airway, right? And then uh, what's our next? Yeah, the gunshot wounds, right? You guys are great. You guys are great. All right. All right, so using the TCCC standard of care and pre-hospital battlefield method, remember, this is pre-hospital. So this is like you are walking down to Robinson's get to get some groceries, and an earthquake happens, natural disaster. And you're the only person there. This is pre-hospital. All right, so using TCCC and following the massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulations, high to hypo, and providing life-saving skills, you too can save a life. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we'll be going, we're breaking off. We're going to show you five life-saving skills. It's going to be little cards, five life-saving skills that is pretty much TCCC. So give us, go ahead and take a five-minute bathroom break, come back and then we'll have uh, everything set up, okay? Thank you.
Is everyone back? Look to left and look to right. Is everyone here? They huh? They're, they moved? Okay. Everyone here? Okay, I think everyone's here. Okay, so I'm going to count one through five, and then you're going to break off into a, a group. All right, so this will be... So if you're one, come over here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? So go ahead and count off. One. 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 One, 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 four. Okay, if you uh, you know where to go. One, two, three, four, five. So we have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh, only an hour 15 divided by five is right. That's 60 minutes. How much is that? Okay, 12, okay. Hey, instructors, 10 minutes, 10 minutes each station, okay? Then we rotate. 10 minutes and then we rotate. You got a timer?
team, we're at less than one minute. Less than one minute for each station, and then we're going to rotate. Rotate, rotate, rotate. If you're at five, so we're going to go this way, this way, this way. So five, come down here. Four, come to me. Three, go to two. One, go to five. So one, you go to five. Shift, everybody shift. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Time, tight time frame, tight time frame. Juan, tell him to rotate. Okay, rotate. <laughs>
All right, rotate. Go this way, this way, this way. Thank you, guys. Yeah, of course, man. Rotate, rotate. Instructors, make sure you rotate them. Five is going, one is going to five, five going to four, four going to three, three going to two, two going to one. Five, five over there. Five up there. Three right here. If you're coming from four, I'm three. Come to three, come to three, rotate. All right, rotate, rotate, rotate. Everyone here, everyone here. Perfect, okay. All right, can I see one of these?
Uh, team rotate, instructors rotate. Uh, five go to four, four, three, two, one. Rotate all, rotate all. Goodbye, my friends. I need still that fan. That's okay. All right, come over, come over, come on, come on all.
instructors, rotate, rotate your team. This should be the last station. It should be last station. Last station, rotate, last station, rotate. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Make sure you, instructors, make sure you're rotating on time. LT Perez, make sure you're rotating them. Don't worry, we'll have time for photo op today. Don't worry. Lieutenant Andrada, rotate your team, rotate your team. <laughs> rotate, 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 rotate. I'm sorry, rotate, rotate, rotate. There you go.
All right, it's that time, instructors. We are done with Teach with the VLS. Woo! We're done. We're done for morning. Morning is done. Ma'am, what's the next scheme of maneuver? Lieutenant, what's the next scheme of maneuver? I, huh? Lunch? Got it. Everyone go ahead, take your seats. We're going to have a 30-minute lecture proper and then break for lunch at 12. Don't worry, we will have lunch. We will have lunch. You will eat. Don't worry. You guys are going to know. I know. Hangry, hangry. <laughs> Working lunch. All right. Once everyone's in seat, we'll have 30-minute lecture. Lieutenant Soratorio, where's the instructor for ICS? ICS? Oh, yeah. ICS, paging ICS. ICS, paging ICS. 30 minutes. Ooh. ICS, paging ICS. Woo, we got ICS. Here you go, Paul. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, please settle down. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm surprised that I was also invited to speak and to introduce the incident command system. <laughs> Uh, I thought I will just be part of the evaluation. So uh, I was introduced to Lieutenant Wilson, and he asked me if I can uh, give lectures on the incident command system. Even though before uh, I was also I was already part of the Lorma disaster emergency response teams, which I created in the Lorma, and I underwent training in the Office of Civil Defense before two, way back 2000, maybe way back 10 years ago. Uh, and then, then Lorma Colleges was chosen and won the Gawad Kalasag, or is award for SHIELD. Only if Lorma won the prize in the Region 1. So we beat, we beat the city disaster, we beat the provincial disaster. And so we had that. Okay. Okay. So task, by the way, uh, to, to our visitors, uh, uniform personnel, thank you very much. Ma'am, sir, for coming in Lorma. It was a great honor and pleasure to work with you and to learn under your uh, service. Okay. Those who don't know me, my name is. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, just like them, uh, uniform personnel, I'm also a member of the Philippine Coast Guard Auxiliary under 704 Squadron of the Sea Guard Northwestern Luzon with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Yeah, that's why I'm wearing <laughs> okay. so, yeah. Quiet, quiet. Okay, so I believe that this slide is ready. There's the slides. Some point slides. Ah, okay. Thank you. Ah, okay. So please uh, take your seat. Uh, enjoy the moment while we're waiting for the PowerPoint. <laughs> So the slides, in the, in, in the Philippines, they call called PowerPoint, but should supposedly it should be the slides, presentation. Did I go prepared? <laughs> okay, anyway, on the second semester, I will be your instructor to the NCM 121. That is the emergency disaster nursing. It is actually a new subject for the nursing curriculum. As recommendation of the International Council for Nurses, 
and also stated in the Hugo framework that the disaster preparedness or the program should be incorporated in the academy. Tama? Alam nyo na? <laughs> okay, so let's wait. So any feedback about the program, ma'am? <laughs> what can you say about the program? What did you learn? <laughs> any, any, any feedback? It has been an educational experience. Oh. Yeah. Any more? No more. <laughs> no more? Okay, how about this side? Any feedback? Hmm. Uh, give us more knowledge and awareness about uh, disasters. Like, uh, training. Training, okay. <laughs> so that is the first step for you to learn the disaster management. Auto disaster management is a very exciting field for you to practice later on in the future. You will run, rescue, scream from the top of your lungs. Anyone who are there? Wala. Okay, so let's wait for the slides. Uh, intermission? Intermission daw. Hello. <laughs> Sige na. Who would like to sing? Kinakanta ko kasi mapatay eh. Habang may buhay. <laughs> Okay, so good morning. Still good morning. Still, the time is 11.35. Okay, so I'm here to uh, share to you about the concepts of incident command system. The incident command system is very important in disaster management. Without incident command system, it's like you are looking for a needle in a pile of spoon. Isn't it? Is it ironic? Don't you think? <laughs> okay, sir, next. Okay. Sige pa. So the incident command system, going back, is a model for command control and coordination of emergency response at the site level, meaning at the site level, where the incident happen. Okay, how to react, how to do the command, who will be the people will handle the situations. Who are they? Can you do everything? No. Okay? So example, example for the lesson that without a formal incident command system. Look what happened in the picture. What do you see? Come again? Huh? Ano? Casualties. What else? Chaos. What else? A group of rescuers, police, and other uniformed personnel and other government agencies working to resolve the issue or to rescue the people. Okay, what happened is that the police and fire department did not work together that day. And they, re they rarely did before. So there is a command and control issue. They are receiving command from the, the chief of PNP. And they are, the Bureau of Fire is receiving also command from the chief of fire. So who will handle the situation? There will be no overlapping of rules. Okay? And also, other firefighters appear to have been using one radio channel while evacuation orders went out over another. Imagine, one channel of radio. This one is the police station, a police group, this one is the fire. Then they are using the radio channel. Then you want to use, you cannot enter because someone is using. Or there are many messages from, oh, that you will hear over the radio. So what's happening now? 
there will be a problem in the communications. Right? Okay, next. Firestorm in the 2003. The, criti the criticism the review team heard a range from too many bosses. The voice, huh? Bosses. Not Moses. Bosses. To no one running the ship, to lack of coordination to jurisdiction. And the responsibilities were confusing. So there's a command and control issue still. Okay? Next, sir. So the same. ICS structure can also be used to coordinate site support at the emergency operations center or regional or in the provincial level support activity or the national support activity. In the Philippine setting, we have the national level. Okay, that's why we have the NDRRMC or the National Disaster Reduction Risk Management Council down to the barangay level. So NDRMC, regional DRMC, provincial, municipal and city disaster, and we have now your barangay level or the community level. So meaning, what I'm trying to say here, in the reactions of, if you're going to react in any incident, those who in charge in that area should be the one to do the reactions. Okay, not the national, not the provincial, not the city disaster. Instead, the barangay level first. If they cannot handle it, that's the time they will call for help. Okay? So that is to prevent any overlapping of, ro uh, overlapping of roles, the same time to maintain proper channeling of communications. Okay, next. So who uses the incident command system? Anyone? As you can see in the screen, we have the RCMP, the municipal police, ambulance service, fire services, airport authorities, transport authorities, food inspectors, border services, health providers, us, industry, military, them. First Nation groups, and hospitals, labor unions, sheriff services, correctional centers, schools, and shopping centers. Actually, there's, there's what we call basic incidents command system. You can modify that. It depends on the institution or company that where you are working based on the number of populations. So in Lorma, we are populated. We have more than 2,000 students plus the personnel, the staff, the, the employees, the faculty, and everyone. So add them, add them, add them all. That will become more. Uh, it will become almost three thousand. So how are you going to manage that population? Okay, to follow one direction only. No di no uh, commands coming from others. No command will coming from this side. There should be only one, so that everyone will follow. Okay, and that will prevent the situation from a chaotic scenario. Okay, next. So the history of incident command systems came from way back 1970s, where there is a wild land fires during that year. And then there are multiple agencies involved. So if I am the personnel there in that site, there is one who is commanding me to do this. There's also one commanding me to do this or ordering me to do this. Whom shall I follow? I will follow this one that follow that. They will get mad on me. They will going to kick me out from that site. So whom? So there should be only one. Okay? Next. No, no, no. Back. Organizational difficulties experience. So especially if you have no background in the incident command system, you don't know how to utilize this system, there will be really a, what we call, disorganized groups. Okay? Then the result was developed then on the original of the ICS. Okay ba? Gutom ka na? Hungry? Later. Go. Next. So, recurring problems in that area. The use of terminology. Do you know 10-0? 10 1, 10 2, 10 3, 10 4 in the radio communication when you are sending messages. Example in radio. Uh, Alpa Lima, come in. Then you replied. 
Lima Alpha. Then you said your message. Then you heard 10-4. What's that 10-4? Waiting? Ba? Waiting ba? 10-4? <laughs> it's a local lotto. 10-4. So you should know how to use properly. So that when you're going to uh, have this kind of field, then you will uh, attend training and seminars on the basic incident command system. You need also to learn all the terminologies used in the disaster management. Just like us in the medical field, we have medical terminologies, right? That's not being used by other professionals. Oh, what is Alpha? Bravo, to Zay, or to Zebra. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, FG, Golf, Hotel, HL, L, Lima, <laughs> Mike, November, Oscar, OP, Papa, Romeo, Q. What's Q? Quebec, QR, R, R, Romeo, S, Shera, T, Tango, what else? T, U, U, Uniform, V, Victor, W, Whiskey, Y, W, X, X, <laughs> X-ray, X, Y, not my last name, Y, Yankee, Z, Zebra. So you should know how to utilize this, those words, uh, those uh, terms, especially if they said, have you seen a plate number PLP? In the radio, you cannot hear clearly the word PLP. So you have to say, Papa Lima Papa. So PLP. Just like I said to you yesterday in the class, the CCRN, if you cannot get it in the, if the audio is not clear, so I spell it Charlie, Charlie, Romeo, November. Diba? Yun, yun. Okay? Organizational structure. The divisions of work. The people assigned to the area. Communications, action plans, span of control, incident facilities, and resource management. This is sometimes a problem. We have basic incident command system, but we are lacking with equipment and resources. How can we react to the incident if we don't have this logistic? Okay, next. Okay, so the key points in the incident command systems are, one, five primary functions. So what are these basic five primary functions? So I will show you later. Another, establishing and transferring of command. How? So I am acting as the incident commander. Here comes the real incident commander. So I need to endorse. Okay? Or I need to go, I need to take some sleep. So I need to endorse it to the incident commander. These are the actions taken in the area. These are the numbers, the figures that we have, and all the data pertinent to the uh, incident, okay? Another single or unified command structure. Just like I said, there will be only one, okay? One leader that will give the command that everyone should follow. Another is management by objectives. What is your goal? To end the scenario, to retrieve all the victims or casualty within 24 hours. And the next 24 hours, everything, all the, uh, the situation should be already controlled. Especially if you are, uh, what do you call this one, attending to a scenario where there is a civil disturbances. Like riots, there are lootings, etc. and so on. Okay? Another is consolidated incident action plans. Comprehensive resource management Unity and chain of command. Okay, this is also very important. If you have personal uh, conflict with the incident command with the incident commander, you have to set aside that. You focus first to the objective. Okay, do not mix your personal problem. If you have a problem personally with the person, do not mix it with your job, because that will disrupt the word chain of command. Okay, you need to follow. Do not insist your, uh, your, the thing that you know. Just like they said, obey first before you 
Ano? You eat? Complain. Di ba? Or pay for it before you complain. Then, manageable span of control, modular organization, personal accountability, common terminology, integrated communications. So, what are these things? So, these are the principles, the 10 principles. Actually, it's not 10. It's a 12 principles of incident command system that you need to remember. Okay? Next, sir. So, what are the, what are the goals of incident command system? One, provide for safety and health of all responders. Do not just go to the area without surveying the scene if the scene is safe. Isn't it? Why? There are victims. The scene is not safe. The environment is not safe. Then you were caught also, uh, let's say, on fire or you were, you, uh, you were electrocuted. Then who will be saving those casualties? you are also part of the casualty. Diba? We don't want to add casualty. As much possible, lessen the number of casualty. Okay? Do not be add as a victim. Because no one will rescue them anymore. You are the rescuer. Who will rescue them? Okay? You, if you are also part of the casualty, then you will be also uh, the one to be rescued. Okay? Another, save lives. That's the main goal. To save lives. Diba? Just like I said, to lessen the number of, as much as possible, lessen the number of casualty. That's why we have triage. The application of your triage color. We have the green, yellow, red, black. Okay, so who is the priority there? The black? The green, the yellow, the red. Okay, so that uh, there will be a chance for them to survive. Okay, those who are tagged as red, then they are the one needed to be transported at the nearest hospital or to be treated first. Okay, how about black? What is black? Okay, dead. Okay, but of course, there's also a proper approach. For a, for a patient tagged with black. Okay, do not abandon them as it is. Cover them. Anything that you can use to cover. Banana leaves, newspaper, or if you have your uh, cadaver bag. Remember to preserve the dignity of the, the, of the person who died. Okay? Another is reduce suffering. Okay? Protect the public health. Protect the government infrastructure, protect property, protect the environment, reduce economic and social losses. Okay, especially if there will be, if there is an earthquake or the country experience with this massive typhoon. So this will be the objective later on. Next, sir. Okay, so this is the example of a basic command system. Okay, there are five positions. The incident commander. Okay. Down is the operations, planning, logistic, and finance. Each group has duties and responsibilities. If you are assigned as the operation, you cannot go to finance and admin. Let the finance admin work. Let them do their, uh, do their responsibilities. You, if you are assigned operations, you are what? Member of the EMS, Emergency Medical Service, the rescue team, Security personnel, logistic, communication. Okay? For the planning, these are the group of people, or for the word planning, to do the plans. Okay? To set the plans in the table. What are you going to do? Which area are you going to proceed? Which is the safer part? There. Logistics, they are available. Uh, they are available. They are responsible for providing all the equipment. Okay? The operations need said, Sir, they will report to the incident commander, we need vehicles, transport vehicles now. Then the command, the command incident commander will give instruction to logistic to provide all the necessary equipment needed by the operation team. There. Then, finance and admin, of course, from the word finance, they are responsible for Liquidations, providing 
all the money resources and admin for the utilization of other resources such as human resources. Okay, next. Okay, so I see a response function, the command is acting as the boss, the operation as the doers, planning as the thinkers, logistic as the getters, and finance admin as the payers. Okay, next, sir. Next, na, next. Na. Okay, so you have to set your objective priorities. What is your objective? To end the situation within the 24 hours or the next 36 hours. Or everything should be controlled already. Evacuate all uh, people in the affected area. Especially during typhoon. And we know that the Philippines is sitting, as, is sitting in the Pacific Ring of Fire. We are very prone to the Philippines vulnerable to typhoon, strong typhoons and earthquake. We don't have snow, huh? We don't have blizzard. We don't have that. And do not dream on blizzard. Okay? We don't have jacket. Mahal. Mahal ang jacket dito. Okay? Then the responsibility, responsible for all incident or event activity. <coughs> See you, sir. Okay. So the incident commander, the one who stands as the boss, is responsible for all incident or event activity. There will always be an accident, an incident commander. But in the event, example, you are the first person to arrive in the scene. The incident commander is not yet present. Who will act as the incident commander? For the meantime, the one who arrived first. Okay, to control the... Yes, ma'am. Tain na. <laughs> tog, tog, or na? Tog, sa rin? Tom Goods na, Tom Goods. Okay, so that's it. Uh, let me just finish, sir. Next. Just a few slides more. Okay, more, sir. Sige pa. Sige lang, sir. Sige lang. Sige lang, sir. Ay, by the way, going back, sir. Going back. Okay, information officer. Okay, the role of information sent of information officer, he is the only person who will give information to the public. Not the operations, not the planning, not the logistics, not the finance, not even the incident commander. So if there is a news reporter who will arrive in the scene, do not go there just to be interviewed for public exposure. Let the information officer do his job. Okay? Because this is sometimes a problem. If you see a media, you go at the back, or you go in front of the camera saying, Hi. Then they will interview you. Oh, yes, yes, I know. What if you give a false information that will affect the whole organization? Meaning they are incompetent to do their functions. Okay, next, sir. Go on. Sige pa. Sige pa. Sige pa. Sige pa, sir. Sige pa. More? No, sa almost last part na, last part. Sige pa. Sige pa. Sige pa, sir. More? Okay. So, going back. So, this is that what this is the incident command uh, system or structure organized for Lorma colleges for both campuses, Lorma College, Carlatan, and Lorma College, San Juan. So as you can see at the top, I'm the one who is deciding as the incident commander. You can modify the incident command system as long as the basic core principle of incident, com of incident command system is incorporated to your organizational structure. So as you can see, from the incident commander, we have the assistant, we also have the planning, support group or the operations group. We have under support group or operations, we have the rescue unit, emergency medical service, safety and security, transportation unit, and the logistics. Then we also have the evacuation team. Per team, okay, we have the area room captain per floor. And we also have the exit guards. The one who will point you that this is the exit. Okay? In short, they are the last group of people who will leave 
or who will evacuate the structure. If they will die, they, they die. Don't worry, there's a search and rescue there. They will rescue them. Okay? Uh, there. Okay, so that is the... And then the next is we have communication unit. They are the one who is managing all the communication, internal and external communications. Okay? We also have a firefighting group. In case there is fire, automatically the firefighting group will be activated to, ex to extinguish the fire. Okay? And by the way, the evacuation team, they are responsible also for the numbers of people evacuated. They need to do the counting, head counts. If they are missing, then they will report to the incident commander if there's a need for search and rescue. Okay? So that's it. That's the incident command, the incident command system of the Lorma Carriages. Thank you, ma'am, sir, for the opportunity. Okay, so I think it's already 12 o'clock, and I was asked to four time out. Okay, so, yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, students, please come back at 1 p.m. 12.59, you should be here already. Okay? Oh, sige, alis na. <laughs> Go na. <laughs> okay, so yun. <laughs>